Picture this. It's 1968. You're sitting behind the wheel of a Camaro SS. The light turns green. You floor it. And in that split second between your foot hitting the pedal and the rear tires breaking loose, there's a piece of machinery doing something absolutely magical. It's not the engine getting the glory. It's not the exhaust note everyone's talking about. It's the transmission. TH400, Power Glide, Torque Flight, TH350, the C6, and one transmission that nobody, and I mean nobody, saw coming in a video about automatics. These weren't just gearboxes. They were the difference between winning and losing, between legendary and forgotten, between muscle car royalty and garage queen disappointment. Today, we're putting them all in the same ring, six gladiators, each one responsible for more quarter mile victories, more burnout competitions, and more street racing legends than any other parts in automotive history. And that last one, trust me, you'll want to stick around. It's going to completely flip everything you think you know about this entire conversation. Part one, TH400, the tank. Let's start with the heavyweight champion. The transmission that GM originally built for Cadillacs and luxury cruisers, but accidentally created the most indestructible drag racing weapon in history. 1964. General Motors had a problem. Their luxury customers were complaining about harsh shifts and poor reliability. So GM's engineers went to work creating the smoothest, strongest automatic transmission they'd ever built. They called it the Turbo Hydromatic 400. But here's where it gets interesting. Those same engineers had no idea they were creating a monster. The case was cast aluminum, thick as a tank. The planetary gear sets were overbuilt for luxury car duty. The valve body was precision engineered for smooth shifts. And the torque converter? Absolutely massive. Within two years, drag racers discovered something incredible. You could dump 1,500 horsepower through this thing, with major upgrades installed, of course, and it would just ask for more. Pro stock racers started swapping them into everything. Chevelle, Camaros, Novas. Even Ford guys were secretly running them because nothing Ford made could handle the abuse. Here's a fact that'll blow your mind. The 400 weighs about 40 pounds more than most other automatics. In drag racing, where every ounce matters, guys were actually adding weight to their cars just to get this transmission. That's how much stronger it was than everything else. And the sound. Oh man, the sound. When a properly built 400 shifts under full power, it doesn't just click into the next gear, it slams home with this mechanical authority that tells you something serious just happened. But don't go anywhere yet. Because that transmission I mentioned at the beginning, the curveball, it's coming. And it's going to change everything you think about this entire discussion. Part two, Power Glide, the assassin. Now let's talk about the transmission that everyone laughed at until it started embarrassing them at the track. Two gears, that's it. While everyone else was bragging about their three and four speed automatics, Chevrolet was still selling cars with a transmission that had exactly two forward gears, first gear and high gear, nothing in between. On paper, it was a joke. A two-speed automatic in the muscle car era, just mind-boggling. But drag racers started noticing something weird. These things were nearly unbreakable. And more importantly, they had something no other automatic could match. Absolutely no parasitic loss between first and second gear. See, most automatics have multiple gear sets that are always spinning, always creating friction, always stealing power from the engine. But with only two gears, this thing was mechanically simpler. Less friction, less power loss, more power to the wheels. The first guy to figure this out was probably some unknown racer in California who threw one behind a big block and realized he was running faster times than guys with better transmissions. 
word spread through the drag racing underground like wildfire. Pro stock teams started building dedicated race versions. The case was aluminum instead of iron, so it was lighter. Side note, early versions of this trans was cast iron. The internals were beefed up to handle massive torque, and the gear ratios were perfect for quarter-mile racing. Here's the kicker. While muscle car buyers were paying extra for the advanced three-speed automatics, the smart money was ordering the cheap two-speed option and laughing all the way to the winner's circle. By the early 70s, nearly every serious drag racer was running one of these. Not because it was sophisticated, because it was effective. And remember, we've still got that mystery transmission coming. The one that doesn't fit with everything else we're talking about. Keep watching. Part 3. Torque Flight. 727. Mopar's Pride. Chrysler had a different philosophy. While GM was building tanks and Ford was building truck transmissions, Mopar said, What if we made something that was strong and smart? The Torque Flight 727 wasn't just tough. It was engineered. Every component was designed to work in perfect harmony with Chrysler's big block engines, especially the legendary 440 and 426 Hemi. See, most transmissions were designed as generic units that could work behind any engine. But Chrysler built this specifically for high-performance applications. The torque converter was matched to the power curve of their engines. The shift points were calibrated for maximum acceleration. Even the cooling system was designed around sustained high-power operation. NASCAR teams figured this out first, while other manufacturers were constantly rebuilding transmissions during race weekends, the Chrysler teams were running the same unit race after race after race. Richard Petty's crew chief once said they could run a 727 for an entire season without a rebuild. In NASCAR, where transmissions are under constant abuse for 500 miles at a time. But it wasn't just the durability, this thing was smart. The valve body had a sophistication that other manufacturers wouldn't match for years. It could sense engine load, throttle position, even road speed, and adjust its shift patterns accordingly. Street racers loved this, because it meant the transmission would shift differently depending on how hard you were pushing it. Cruising around town, smooth as silk, full throttle at the track, it would shift like it was angry. And here's something most people don't know. The 727 was one of the first automatics designed with a manual valve body option. You could literally convert it to full manual control for drag racing, while keeping all the strength of the automatic internals. Plymouth and Dodge guys weren't just proud of their engines, they were proud of their transmissions too, with good reason. But that mystery transmission we keep talking about? It's still coming, and it's going to flip this entire conversation on its head. Part 4, TH350, The People's Champion While the 400 was the heavyweight champion, General Motors needed something for the regular folks. Something lighter, cheaper, more fuel-efficient, but still strong enough to handle a small block with attitude. Enter the Turbo Hydromatic 350, the everyman's hero. This wasn't built for luxury cars or NASCAR teams. It was built for Camaros, Chevelles, Novas, and Monte Carlos. Cars that regular people could actually afford, but still wanted to have some fun with. The genius of the 350 wasn't what it could do. It was what it could do for the price. GM managed to build a transmission that was about 80% as strong as the 400, but cost significantly less to produce. Weight was the big advantage. The 350 was almost 50 pounds lighter than its big brother. In a Camaro Z28 or a Nova SS, that weight savings was right where you wanted it. Behind the engine, helping with weight distribution. But here's where it gets really interesting. The aftermarket went absolutely crazy for these things. Because they were lighter and smaller, they fit into places where the 400 wouldn't. Engine swap guys started using them in everything. Early Camaros, 50s Chevys, even non-GM cars. 
And because GM made literally millions of them, you could find cores everywhere. Junkyards were full of them. Performance shops started offering build services. By the 80s, you could buy a built 350 that would handle 600 horsepower for less than what a stock 400 cost. The Quarter Mile Times tell the story. A properly set up 350 behind a strong, small block could run times that were within a tenth of a 400 setup. But the car would be quicker out of the hole because of the weight savings. Street strip guys loved them because they were reliable enough for daily driving but strong enough for weekend warrior duty at the local drag strip. Even today, if you're building a classic muscle car on a budget, the 350 is probably your best bet. Not because it's the strongest, because it's the smartest choice. Speaking of smart choices, that transmission we've been hinting at, the one that doesn't belong in this conversation, we're almost there. And it's going to completely change how you think about this entire topic. Part 5. Ford C6. The Survivor. Ford had been watching GM dominate the transmission wars for years. The 400 was embarrassing everything Ford had. So in 1966, Ford's engineers had one goal, build something as strong as GM's best transmission. They succeeded. Maybe too well? The C6 was Ford's answer to the 400. Cast iron case, massively overbuilt internals, designed to handle anything Ford could throw at it. It was later switched to cast aluminum to save weight. But here's what made it special. While GM built the 400 primarily for luxury cars, Ford designed the C6 for trucks first. Heavy-duty trucks, work trucks, commercial vehicles. This meant it had to survive abuse that would kill a passenger car transmission. Constant heavy loads. Stop-and-go traffic. Extended high-temperature operation. The works. When Ford started putting these behind their big block Mustangs, Cobras, and Torinos, something magical happened. They had accidentally created one of the most durable performance transmissions ever built. Police departments loved them. The C6 could handle the abuse of pursuit vehicles better than anything else available. High-speed chases, repeated launch abuse, extended idle periods. It didn't matter. Drag racers took notice. While it wasn't quite as refined as the GM units, it was nearly indestructible. You could abuse it in ways that would destroy other transmissions, and it would just keep working. Here's the really impressive part. Ford kept making the C6 until 1996, 30 years of production. It outlasted the muscle car era, the malaise era, the fuel crisis, everything. Because it was just that good. Even today, if you find a C6 in a junkyard, there's a good chance it still works. They're like the cockroaches of the transmission world, nearly impossible to kill. But Ford guys didn't just respect it. They were genuinely proud of it. After years of watching GM guys brag about their transmissions, Ford finally had something to brag back with. And that mystery transmission, the one we keep teasing, get ready. Because it's about to completely destroy everything you think you know about this conversation. Part 6, The Curveball. Muncie M22 Rock Crusher. Boom. Not even an automatic. How about them apples? You've been sitting there for 20 minutes listening to us talk about automatics. And now we're going to tell you that one of the most legendary transmissions in muscle car history was a manual. A four-speed manual that GM built specifically to embarrass every automatic transmission on the planet. The Muncie M22 Rock Crusher. See, while all these automatics were fighting for supremacy, there was this group of purists who said, you know what? All of you are wrong. If you really want to go fast, you need to control the gears yourself. And they had a point. The Rock Crusher got its nickname from the sound it made. This distinctive whine that came from the straight-cut gears. It sounded like machinery. Like precision like speed. But it wasn't just the sound. This thing was built like a safe. The case was cast aluminum, just like the 400. The gear sets were massive. The synchronizers were designed for race-level abuse. 
here's what made it legendary. While automatics always lose some power through the torquey converter, the Rock Crusher delivered 100% of the engine's power directly to the rear wheels. No slippage. No power loss. Pure mechanical connection. Drag racers who were serious about going fast had to make a choice. Take the consistency and ease of use of an automatic, or take the maximum performance potential of the Rock Crusher. The guys who chose the manual were usually the ones setting track records, but it wasn't for everyone. You had to know how to drive it. Launch technique was critical. Shift timing was everything. Miss a shift, and you'd either blow the engine or grenade the transmission. The automotive press called it unforgiving. Racers called it honest. It would only perform as well as the driver behind the wheel. Here's a story that sums up the Rock Crusher perfectly. There was a local street racer in Detroit, let's call him Mike, who had a Chevelle SS with a Rock Crusher. He'd park at the local drive-in on Friday nights, and guys with automatics would constantly challenge him. Mike would pop the hood, point to his four-speed, and say, You sure about this? Most guys would back down just from hearing that distinctive whine during the burnout. The ones who didn't back down usually learned why they should have. Six transmissions, each one legendary for different reasons. The 400 was the tank that could handle anything you threw at it. The two-speed was the underdog that proved sometimes less is more. The 727 was the engineered precision that Mopar built their reputation on. The 350 was the affordable hero that democratized performance. The C6 was the survivor that outlasted everything else. And the Rock Crusher was the purist's choice that demanded respect. But here's what they all had in common. None of them were the star of the show. They weren't the parts that got the magazine covers or the bench racing bragging rights. The engines got the glory. The exhaust systems got the attention. The paint jobs got the compliments. These transmissions were the silent partners, the unsung heroes, the parts that actually made everything else possible. Every burnout that ever melted a set of tires, every quarter mile pass that made someone a local legend, every street race victory that built a reputation, every muscle car moment that became a lifelong memory. None of it happens without the transmission. They weren't flashy. They weren't the parts people bragged about at car shows. But every single automotive legend you've ever heard of was built on the foundation of one of these transmissions, doing its job perfectly when everything else was on the line. Automatics or manuals? GM, Ford, or Mopar? Two speeds or four speeds? Cast iron or aluminum? It didn't matter. These weren't just transmissions. They were the parts that built legends. And the next time you hear someone arguing about which engine was the best of the muscle car era, remind them that the engine only matters if you can get the power to the ground. That's where these six gladiators lived, in that split second between intention and action, between horsepower and speed, between dreaming about going fast and actually doing it. The transmission wars weren't just about engineering. They were about making heroes out of regular people who wanted to go fast. And in that mission, every single one of these transmissions won.